So I think, you know, the, the, just to start thinking about, okay, why, why, why do we actually need to prepare differently for AI than for software processes? So, so far we've done okay with what we're doing. Um, why do we need to um, prepare differently for AI? Um, Shoba, do you maybe want to talk about a little bit how you prepare your clients for AI differently than in traditional software processes? Sure. I think one of the things is when we, when we had the, the uh, transformation from software, we weren't really quite at the speed of light uh, even then. It was faster than anything before. But I think the two things that are, that are critical today that's different and why preparedness needs to be approached differently is that the sheer speed and magnitude of what we're dealing with is just so accelerated and time spans are so, you know, they're nanoseconds. So you really, it is about agility in, in every aspect. Uh, and the second thing is we really have a globalized economy and certainly a lot of the people in this room and companies like Alliance, for example, uh, a lot of the workforce is highly distributed. And when you have both of these things uh, concurrently happening, I think the approach is not just a technology approach, it really is a mindset approach. And the industry, the financial services and the uh, insurance industry are one of the final industries, I think, to truly accept that change is going to happen. I think there's a lot of the industry that still thinks, well, you know, um, it's only going to affect certain aspects and they haven't fully digested, it's going to completely turn things upside down. Yeah. So I think the approach needs to be different. And, and Ilko, I think you've gone through the process actually uh, implementing AI and underwriting within your organization. Can you maybe share with the audience a little bit how your preparation within this project was different to maybe other processes in traditional software engineering that you've gone through before? Yeah, as, uh, as Aon, we are an uh, insurance broker, but just as insurers, we, also, we are also very keen on, uh, on lowering our costs and creating more efficiency. So what we are really looking into, and that is also something that the, uh, the many startups here have presented, uh, recently we have uh, made an agreement, a partnership uh, with uh, Zesty.ai, and it's a little bit similar as, uh, as Tractable just, uh, just showed, because we as an insurance broker are also very much reliant on data, and uh, many times our data itself or our core processes can't really help us establishing the, the right data and the, the, the proper amount of data we need. So therefore, we, we came into a cooperation with, uh, with Zesty. And what they do, and, and what, we, what is beneficial to us, is that they have a, an artificial intelligence platform with a lot of property data and a lot of financial data, which enables us not to have a physical risk control inspection at various sites or various plants everywhere across the world, but we can really translate the data they have into our own processes, so in order to uh, provide better uh, underwriting premiums. So Bowie, that is something that we do different than we did in the past. Yeah. So I think interest interestingly, one of the first steps to, to implementing AI, and I think you know we can all agree on that, is having a proper data strategy. So your AI is only as intelligent as your data is. And if we think about maybe an example where it didn't go so well is, uh, I think a few years back, uh, Google had an AI, uh, an AI bot called Ty, um, and uh, it was fed uh, by Twitter users with, with data and uh, was then responding to them. And then the, the outcome of that was actually that Ty became incredibly racist, sexist, homophobic, because the data that users on Twitter would, were, were feeding Ty was bad and so Ty wasn't able to to obviously judge is this good or is this bad, do I have the right morals or so on. So um, the question is how do companies actually avoid this? How do they make sure that they feed the AI that they, that they want to create um, good quality data? Um, how, do, how do companies make sure that data strategy become part of their core strategy as well, right? So, Machi, I know you're working with you know loads of corporations, you know on 
implementing you know data in in in, in uh, their core strategy can you maybe share you know a little bit about uh, how how you go about it yeah we have many experience with cooperation with insurers tpas and brokers uh, of course we are keen of uh, operation with other partners but uh, our main uh, activity is uh, to digitalize difficult words yeah the di digitalized process of notifying handling um, the, the claim um, uh, this is the, the final stage of the uh, I would say life track of, of, of insurance uh, it is everyone who is sitting on this on this place uh, has a smartphone in, in his pocket and uh, using our app it is uh, very easy to start the history of their claim uh, to not you can notify claim via our app I report we can dedicate the backend system mm -hmm. uh, the, nice, nice uh, fig tree for administration the claims and all of this uh, activity based on the data and, uh, as you said, uh, it is very important to be aware of uh, quality of the data, uh, all these legs of, with, with data. Uh, we have uh, also demanding uh, task because uh, the, the, our sister company, Flight Claim U, uh, we have a platform for, for notifying the flight delays, mm -hmm. claims as well. And we are running this in 16 uh, languages at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, language was Indian, because we've uh, found that, uh, that, that many of uh, people from India are going to and uh, from Europe. Uh, so this is always uh, the, 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 the scope of our in interest. So uh, as I said, uh, it is very uh, it is very important to have uh, the, the, the full awareness of, of, of data that we possess. I met um, uh, yesterday a colleague from, from, from reinsurance company. They have uh, tons, plenty of data. Yeah. But uh, the, 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 the challenge is, uh, is to, uh, to use this data in a proper way for the clients and for our own businesses as well. Yeah, and I think it will determine the quality of the data will determine the speed at which, you know, you can start something as well. So, you know, as, as an investor with, you know, many portfolio companies working with data, one of the key issues that they often have coming into, uh, into, into their clients is um, they want fast results, but they, the first thing that they need to do is actually structure the data that exists in various different places within the company and various different forms into one format that they can actually process, right? So maybe Ilko, from your real life example, can you talk about how how do you how did you go in you know in your example with this underwriting you know project? How did you go about you know structuring your data, making the data available for the AI, and how long did it take you to do that? Well, as you perhaps know, is that uh, in a lot of insurance companies and also with insurance brokers, there are basically three silos. Uh, you have the, the account management, the underwriting, and the claims uh, department or silos. And traditionally, it's very difficult for all of these three silos to actually have a unified or uniform data approach. And um, to answer the question that, that, Bowie, uh, that Bowie asked me is that we found it uh, particularly difficult how we could uh, generate all these various data streams in our three silos, uh, account management, underwriting, and claims, how we could make them unified. So we came up with uh, the conclusion that we were not able to do it ourselves the way we would like it to do. So that's why we made a deliberate choice to uh, um, well enter agreements or enter partnerships with various startups who were really capable of making a unified approach for us possible. So uh, instead of looking it in our own organization, we found out that it was better to partner with third parties, startups, to have a unified data approach. And to answer your question, Bowie, it took us quite a while, and that is due to the fact that we as an organization, we live by data because the data we have with, with that data, we, we make offers and products and services to our clients. So it's a very difficult situation 
where you have various silos with all their separate data to make a unified approach when it comes to uh, data. So it took us quite a while, but in, in the end we succeeded due to the fact that we partnered with, uh, with third parties. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think that's just helpful to, to sort of manage expectations along the way as well, that yes, we want to implement AI and we're ready for it, but it's not gonna happen tomorrow because you know, first we need to implement the data in the right form to be able to train the AI the way we want it to operate. So maybe it's leading us on to, on to the next point. So uh, it's, AI is obviously not a point solution that only affects one division within the company. It actually affects the full corporation and it affects processes that touch many different divisions. And how can we actually make sure that we, that we get cultural buy-in, both from all of the management divisions that are important for the process, but also from the people who operate this AI on an everyday basis. So maybe sometimes there's a stigma around people being afraid of AI because they think that AI would take away their jobs, or AI would um, do something that they don't want to do and they're a little bit scared of it. So maybe Rob, you know, you on an everyday basis obviously deal with clients, you know, as, as a CRO, um, you know, how do you, how do you advise your clients to make sure that you, you get the right buy-in from all sides? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from a workflow company. We do open source, so I'm not entirely about AI, but probably the question is not too much different on how to introduce something new. It's, I see it increasingly relevant. The higher the expectations are, and they are high with AI. So you look at inflated expectations. The industry has probably realized that something is going to change, but what will that look like? So you, you have to take the people by the hand and you, you probably don't want to bring in the McKinsey's and just create the biggest strategy program where a lot of PowerPoint is created and then um, nobody really knows how it feels like. So what we always advise people when they start something new, a new technology is look for a relevant problem to fix in the first place. Not just do AI in an area because AI can do something for you there, but make sure you're looking at a relevant problem of your organization where there is actually a lot of impact if you fix it. And if you find a couple of those, I would say pick the smallest one of those and create a group of people, a small group of people around that problem to fix it with a new kind of a technology. Because what you want to do is when you introduce something new to an organization is you want to create success as soon as possible. And success is eventually impact on the business. So um, like if, you, if you're asking on, on like how to get that into the organization, get the buy-in, my advice would be start small and aim at a very, very quick mm -hmm. but meaningful success. Yeah. And Shoba, you, this is exactly in your, in your area of you know, everyday expertise. So at Hard Skills, you're working with companies to get ready for AI and you know, a digital change, right? So how, what do you advise your clients to, to go about first? Yeah, I guess the, the, the main uh, advice we give clients is you can't just focus on a team in the AI division if anyone actually has such a thing or in, the, in, in picking one silo, right? because really this is a organizational transformation. And in the same way that compliance training or safety training and these sorts of huge, really important issues are done enterprise-wide, uh, the reason we created our business was because we realized that behavior change and the mindset change to be more receptive uh, to change needs to happen from the top, from a you know, board level, C level, right down to, to the, the factory floor or the, the front line of the customer. Now the interesting thing is we all talk about these job losses because of AI, but the reality is if you take the insurance industry, it's very, very tight employment right now, right? Unemployment rate is 1.7% for the insurance industry, which is half that of the US un national unemployment rate. So I think the jobs that are going away are jobs that can't be filled in any case 
right? And if you look at the outsource, a lot of the insurance industry's jobs have been outsourced to markets like Philippines and India. Uh, and even there, the automation actually is good news because people can be elevated, and that's what it's all about in any event, right? Um, societal good. So you want to change people from processing and distillation activities to higher order thinking things like decision making and creative um, analysis, right? So I think uh, if you put that lens and you try and train people to understand there's nothing to fear, but this is an opportunity to move up the food chain, to move up the ladder, I think you can actually see a lot of benefit. And we see that with the consulting firms, companies like Ernst & Young um, are investing a lot of money globally to change the mindset of their employee base. And, and Marchi, you have quite an interesting background that you're working with companies often in, you know, emerging markets in like Eastern European markets, right? So how is that different in, you know, thinking about sort of cultural buy-in and, you know, what are like the specifications because you've obviously been around, so like various, uh, you know, um, um, technolo technological transformations, right? And AI is just the next one. Yeah, it's, it is growing very rapidly, especially in these um, emerging markets. Um, developing markets uh, and I during my recent uh, conference in Kiev um, the, one of the, um, the participants ask, asked me what happened with uh, what, ha what happened with us if uh, the people will, will be replaced by the robots by the, all this uh, uh, intelligence uh, artificial intelligence it is very difficult to answer in a um, few sentences, as Shabas said. Uh, but I asked him, uh, are you working five days a week? Yes. What, what do you think about working three days a week, two days a week, with the same salary? Of course, everybody is happy. Why? The robots are generating GDP as well. Where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> so, we should be more optimistic, uh, and uh, there is no place to be real afraid of, of, about the future, because this future, these um, uh, new models, new technologies are for us, not we for them. Yeah, and so Shoba, you mentioned that the change really needs to come from the top, right? But uh, how, how do we, how can we actually make sure that actually from the top it also dribbles down to the bottom? Well, I don't think that's too difficult, right? Because the, very often the middle and the bottom take the signal from the top. So really the, the, the biggest challenge is cracking the top. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, one of the ways is a lot of these companies are public companies. And I think that, that, that um, the, the markets send them a signal. Uh, but I think the whole, you know, one of the reasons you, you've heard you talk about startups and there's a lot of collaboration and and we are part of the SAP Startup Accelerator here. And I was just telling Bobby, I, you know, I, I rushed over after a meeting with executives from Vodafone. So I think uh, the message is the genie is out of the, uh, 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 the lamp now because I think big companies right at the top are recognizing that uh, they may not be the best people internally, to drive this change. They can't see the, the mirror. They need to go outside uh, and collaborate with much more nimble partners. And I think that recognition is happening at the very top of the Fortune 500. And that's a trickle-down effect that is transforming how business is done today. And I think the next five years are going to be pretty exciting um, as you see more collaboration between the startups and the end-ups. Um, to try and meet in the middle, right? Yeah. And so I think one of the key questions to implementing AI is um, how do, do companies already have the right talent to implement the, the AI the way they want to? Uh, how do they attract that talent? And how do they retain that talent, right? So I think it's a question that is probably not only related to AI, but AI, AI is a specific field that is so new that you won't find someone who has 10 years of experience in AI because AI just hasn't been around for that long in, in the form it is today, right? So 
Rob, maybe do you want to comment on how, you know, how, do comp how can companies make sure that they attract the right talent, that you know, talent doesn't get eaten up by just Google or just IBM and they all go and you know, uh, work, work for the same companies? Yeah, sure. I'm, I mean, it's, it's hard to answer that question, but the first answer, like how to actually make sure the people come to you, but um, one thing is probably um, what we have to realize is that all of these companies one way or the other turn into IT companies. So we heard it this morning, like when we talk about AI, it's 70% sits with the data scientist. Um, if it's about process, it's with the software developer. You say the people on the top don't really see what's going on in the weeds because it's, a lot of it is happening in, in IT. So when we look at the talent aspect of it, we will see traditional companies turning more and more towards being an IT company that is about risk or if it's insurances or an IT company that is about money if we talk about banks. So at least that's how we see it and um, if you, yeah, if you try to facilitate that you basically need to provide those IT people which are which have all the choice in the world. They can work wherever they want. They don't care about the security of their jobs. They will go where they like to work. And you have to create that environment. I don't know what that specifically means for AI, but it's definitely a piece of it. Yeah, I, ha I had a very good quote, so it's not my own quote, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back that said, uh, when you hire someone in order to retain them, make sure that what they came to you for, so the motivations that they came to you for, remains within your company. So if you sort of take that away, if you know researchers come to you, data scientists come to you because they're curious about finding out something about AI, developing something new, if you don't give them that opportunity, they will leave to do to go to someone who will give them that opportunity, right? So that sort of retaining the original motivation in a company is very important to um, a specific field that is so in demand right now where developers or you know data scientists and so on, almost every company is looking for them, right? So um, Ilko, do you maybe want to comment on how do you even select people who can do AI? Like what kind of people can do AI? Since it hasn't been around for so long, what would be a good profile of someone who implements AI on your projects, for example? Well, we, we, we did an uh, internal uh, analysis a couple of years ago where we really wanted to look into the question, are the people we have aboard, are they the people who can really drive the change? And we found out that wasn't the case. So we thought, well, what should we do to attract and retain other people than we currently have on board? And I think it is a little bit similar as what Shoba mentioned in the beginning. I think the insurance industry is one of the few industries that is still isn't disrupted as a lot of other industries. So what we really try to do, Bowie, is to give uh, candidates a potential and especially in the field of data analytics but also on artificial intelligence IT software etc this is an industry guys and girls where you can really disrupt something so this is a sexy industry for you to work in it, it is not about uh, the claims it is not about the processes but this is an industry that is going to disrupt whether it likes it or uh, doesn't and you can be a part of that so by, by having that, call it a marketing vision, call it a brand vision, we really attracted other types of people than, uh, than before. And is that the end-to-end the, the -end solution? No, I don't think so. But it is a start to attract other people into the business. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. And Shoba, you mentioned earlier that the change really for AI needs to come from the top, right? So now, if you manage to attract all of these great people who can do AI, how can we make sure that they have the right oversight for someone who understands what matters in AI projects at the top to guide these people? Well, it reminds me of the, uh, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, most people leave a company because of the manager, uh, um, not because of the, of the company. But I, you know, I, I just want to pick up on, on your point there about the marketing vision. I do think that it's time to stop uh, treating this AI as, as an evil empire that's about to descend on us. I'd love to see a company go out there and say, come work with us, learn how to manage machines, and have a three-day work week. I think there'll be a lot of takers for that. 
Right. Bao and I will be lining up. Yeah. <laughs> the question still stands. Where do I sign up? Exactly. So, um, but I think the, the uh, you know, we often get clients in the initial conversation, they will say, well, you know, we need to manage change, but it's really the middle and the bottom. At the top, we really understand the threat. And we have to push back and say, no, you know, this is not something that you say, I already have figured it out, but start at the bottom. It really needs to start at the top because people need to see that every because change, what is the definition of change, right? The definition of change is not doing something the old way, right? So who are the people doing things the existing way? Well, the guys and girls who've been around for a while. So I think that recognition really does need to happen at the top. I think it, it's slow for all the obvious fear reasons, but um, like all good disruptions, disruption really achieves the highest success when people are pushed up against the wall. So I think we're almost at that point now. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, one of the good things to, to, capture, um, to capture, you know, the attention of the top is providing them with tangible outcomes, right? Providing right. them saying, well, if you implement AI, it's not, you know, you're not only cool, uh, but you actually provide a, an actual cost saving, you can drive top line growth, and there's various things you can do, but how can we actually make sure that we cre create real value with AI? How do we make it something really tangible, something that it's not just you know, a couple of cool people talking about, um, but that is actually something that has real business impact. So Machi, you know, do you want to comment on like, how you do that with your clients? Like, how do you actually measure the outcome of, of what you do? Uh, it's funny because um, we are coping with something intangible. Mm -hmm. When you are selling apples, you are selling apples. You can see and touch them. When you are selling, selling cars, you can see, touch, drive. But when you are selling uh, insurance, for example, it, you are selling an idea, something absolutely intangible. So uh, the only way to uh, attract people to our vision of, of technology uh, are the fruits. And uh, the fruits of uh, cooperation with uh, new technologies is make it easier, make it uh, um, um, uh, easy to understand, easy to use, uh, so that this intangible uh, part of this business could um, uh, create very, very tangible results. Mm -hmm. faster, faster claims paying, for example. It mm -hmm. is very tangible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Measuring in you know, days of uh, claims actually being paid out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Rob, you actually deal with you know, clients probably asking you every day, right? So if we implement your technology, how do we actually measure it and make sure that it actually gives a you know, real impact in our organization, right? What do you reply to them? Um, yeah, it's, value typically comes in two areas. Um, the first one is, of course, replacing manual work by automation. I think that's the same for um, AI. You can simply calculate that. How many hours did I save because I do that now? I'm not sure if that's the main part of it because um, the other one is like, are we able to bring whatever our product is um, to the customer in a better way? Can we increase the quality of service? and this, is, this can come in so many ways. You can give best, better answers and better interactions to your customers. Oftentimes, it's about speed these days, right? We want things to happen like they happen on Amazon. If we have people working in the background, that doesn't work. So we have increasingly demanding customers who say, I ask you something, I want my answer right away. I want it fast. If I don't get it fast, I go to the next one because they give it fast. So I think that's the two areas to, to kind of look for, for value. Yeah. And do you th if you think about maybe, you know, your internal customers as well, right? So, Ilko, if you think about using AI to maybe do something that's very mundane and that, you know, is maybe a little bit boring to do, um, and you could free up all these resources internally, right? How do you, can you, you know, measure, you know, outcomes maybe in a non, you know, financial way? Maybe like employee happiness because they don't have to do things that are really boring anymore and can actually focus on something that requires, you know, human thinking, right? Do you have, you know, other ways except for financial measures in which you measure the outcome of AI for you? What, what we do, we have those, uh, we call it town hall meetings, where we present real-life case studies of the success we have 
when implementing uh, AI. And it just shows people, it, it, it makes them enthusiastic that results can be delivered in another way than they are used to. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, one of the best ways to show the success of artificial intelligence in an insurance industry, not financial, is just showcasing the people the results it can create. So question to this panel, last question to this panel. So for everyone in the audience, if so we, we promised that we were gonna spill our secrets on how to best implement AI. So if there is only one takeaway that you know everyone should have if they wanted to start implementing an AI strategy tomorrow, just one thing. What should they go about and do tomorrow? What should they you know think about first? Marchi, I'm starting with you. The first is do not do not be afraid. Sorry to do. The first thing is do not be afraid of new of yeah. of, of, the, of, of the change yeah. of um, uh, using the artificial intelligence because uh, we should explain people that is something um, um, uh, that uh, could um, uh, create new value for them um, yeah. and really good results. Yeah. Just uh, j j just uh, we should just talk to the to the customers and uh, communicate the, what is the sense of our, our activities. Yeah, yeah. What should be the result, yeah. final result. So communicate with the right stakeholders, Rob? Look for a suitable problem. Look for a suitable problem, okay. I'm sure there's plenty, but suitable, I guess, is uh, the right thing. You mentioned it before. Ilko? Well, I, I like to finish with a, uh, with a quote. Eh? It's a little bit a panel of quotes. So uh, I would like to say that if we do the things, if we if we keep doing the things we are used to, the outcome will be the same. So the momentum for change is really here. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would say uh, my one takeaway or giveaway would be to approach AI with ethical courage, right? Because it is a complicated topic, it is a complicated issue, so you need to be courageous to take it on. Uh, but some of the complexity which we haven't touched on here uh, is really that uh, there's still a lot unknown about how AI can be used, and therefore this is an opportunity for leadership to step in and to, to put an ethical and courageous step forward. Yeah, good, very good. Thank you very much to everyone and sharing with the audience how to best implement AI. Thank you very much. Big Thank hand you. of applause.